Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. Good afternoon, Team Krulak community, and on behalf of Marine Corps University, the Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Brute Krulak Center for Innovation and Future Warfare, welcome back to the Brutecast, our series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best and innovative and creative thought. I'm your host, Major Ian Brown, Operations Officer at the Krulak Center. Before we begin, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Krulak Center, Marine Corps University, the United States Marine Corps, United States Navy, or any other agency of the U.S. government or any other entity with which our guests might be affiliated. So for today's episode, we're going to take you back to the summer of the year 1900, when foreign diplomats living in Beijing's legation quarter were besieged by Chinese imperial troops and boxers, members of a secret society determined to rid China of foreign influence. Defending the legation quarter was a small international guard that included 56 American sailors and Marines. To survive, the Americans communicated with their foreign allies via hand signals, improvised as food supplies and artillery dwindled, and fought fiercely despite nearly impossible odds, but they could not hold out forever. Relief of the legation quarter required additional U.S. sailors, Marines, and soldiers, as well as an international coalition and uh, facing off against a significantly larger force of imperial soldiers, imperial Chinese soldiers, and boxers. The conflict was the U.S. military's first taste of coalition warfare on a global stage and its first time meeting China on the battlefield. To tell us more about this unique event in record history, we're excited to welcome Ms. Emily Abdow to the broadcast and to talk about her new book, The Boxer Rebellion, Blue Jackets and Marines in China from 1900 to 1901, published by Naval History and Heritage Command uh, this year. The book outlines the conflict and the lessons learned as the United States prepared to assume a much larger global role in the 20th century. Emily joined the Naval History and Heritage Command as writer editor in 2020. She's a graduate of Rice University in Houston, Texas, where she served as co-editor in chief of the Rice Thresher. So Emily, Welcome to the show. We're excited that we actually get to have you here in the Krulak Center because it's not a not a common occasion when we do the broadcast. Most of it is me looking at the guests through my webcam. So I appreciate you taking the time to come down here fighting the horrible, the worst than usual traffic on 95 to get here and talk to us in person about your book. Mm -hmm. um, so I think before we, we got some slides here, but I think before uh, we get to that, maybe just give us kind of the background of, um, you know, how did you come to write this book? What was it that interested you in this particular topic? Yeah, certainly. I uh, thank you so much for having me. So I joined Naval History and Heritage Command in 2020. Uh, and as a writer editor, primarily, I edit monographs and publications by our team of historians. And I also write contributions for our website. And a lot of times how we figure out what we're going to write is we look at our website, which is a wealth of essays and digital digitized primary sources and photos and look and we see what what can we add that we don't have already and my supervisor pointed out that our early 20th century part of the website was a little more sparse and suggested i work in that area and one of the topics that came up when we were chatting was the boxer rebellion and i was immediately interested in that because as both a writer and reader of fiction one of my favorite series ever is the poppy war trilogy which is a Chinese fantasy. So it's inspired by events of the Opium Wars and Sino-Japanese Wars, but it's fantasy and it totally piqued my interest in Chinese history. So I chose the Boxer Rebellion to research and it definitely began as sort of a pandemic passion project. I couldn't go anywhere when I started writing it, but our online reading room at NHHC had, which is Naval History and Heritage Command, has so many digitized resources that there were firsthand reports and accounts by sailors and Marines that were there at every stage of the conflict. So as I was reading through these reports in the summer, by the way, I was writing during the summer. So I think the hot kind of summer heat really helped yeah, me get in the, puts you in the, middle, put in the right? yeah, yeah, June, July, August was when I was writing that initial draft. And I was reading along these reports, June, July, August of 1900. And I really visualized it and I could see this full narrative arc, you know, the, the sailors and Marines who had authored these reports sort of became my main characters of each chapter. Mm -hmm. um, well, initially it was just an article, but became my main characters. And by the time I finished, it was a 15,000 word article that I turned over to my supervisor. So a bit long for the website, it is up there, but he encouraged me and gave me the time and the resources to adapt it into a monograph. And that's when I worked with 
uh, historian Tim Francis at Naval History and Heritage Command, uh, my editor Katie Engel, my designers Christina Daniels and Darnell Searles to develop the monograph, expand it, revise it. And that's also when the pandemic uh, still prevalent, but we were allowed to go into the world a bit more. So I was going to the Navy Department Library, going into our rare book room, finding some really amazing historical maps that I was scanning, uh, some really incredible firsthand accounts, such as an unpublished manuscript of Navy Captain Bowman McCalla, which mm -hmm. I was excited to be able to source. And I also made trips up here to Marine Corps University to look for images. And some of my favorite images in the monograph that I'll share in a bit come from my, my trips here to Marine Corps History Division. Yeah, no, the, uh, we're, we're big fans of the History Division here. They're one of our one of our neighbors here under Education Command. And as we were talking about before, I've, uh, I've, I have some, you know, you've done some formal collaboration between the center and the History Division, but uh, I individually I've done some work with them too. And yeah, the resources they have are fantastic mm -hmm. and they're uh, very helpful in getting access to them. And I would also mention to the audience, if you're interested in looking for stuff to talk about, there's a lot of untapped material in there just waiting for somebody to sort of shine some light on it. So mm -hmm. um, big fans of the History Division. Okay, so um, with that, are we ready to turn over to the sure. presentation? Okay. So as, uh, as I mentioned, the last time I was here, I was conducting image research. And so as we were emailing before, and you mentioned I could bring some slides, I decided it would be great to kind of set the scene, China 1900, and feature some of the images I found, some of which that I'm about to show you are from my visit to Marine Corps University. Um, so without further ado, I think we can flip to the next slide, which okay. will be our first image. So it's this image, a little bit of a funny story that I'll, I'll quick tell is when I showed up at Marine Corps University, uh, there was, I think, a Marine Corps officer who had come in two to three weeks before who had seen this image of Marines in a street on a poster and he had wanted to find it and scan it and blow it up for himself. And so the photo archivists were kind of all in a race to see who could find this image first and they were going through all their boxes of photos, but they hadn't found it yet. But one of the boxes I had requested when I showed up was uh, the box of Private Oscar Upham, who was a Marine that was besieged in Beijing. And he wrote a diary that is also down at Marine Corps University History Division. And when I pulled his box, inside was this folder that was rife, a treasure trove of photos. And one of the first ones in there was this image. And so everyone was very excited that I'd found it. And as a result, they rewarded me by bringing out their nicest scanner and scanning my images for me, which was nice. Oh, I got great. kind of the royal treatment. So thank you for that. Um, so setting the scene, it's the summer of 1900. And the Marines in this picture are in a street in Beijing. And they have just cleared another street of boxers. And as you mentioned in the intro, boxers are members of a Chinese secret society. Uh, they wear red sashes. They practice martial arts that they believe will make themselves immune to bullets. And they have a slogan that includes the translated line, exterminate the foreigners. So they did not want foreigners in China. They wanted them out. Um, and one of another recruiting method is a poster that I include in my monograph that I was I was really entertained to find. Um, and this is a boxer propaganda poster that would have been posted in northern China leading up to 1900. Mm -hmm. And so we can see these caricatures of Western men and they are attacking two dragons and Dragons have always been a very powerful symbol and celebrated symbol in Chinese culture. So this would send a clear anti-foreign message that one, one dragon is eating a Westerner, another looks to be barbecuing another Westerner with his, his flames. Um, and so why was this anti-foreign attitude so prevalent leading up to 1900? So in 1898, we have the flooding of the Yellow River and it wipes out a bunch of crops. And then in 1899, after this flood, we have a drought that arrives and stretches into 1900. And some of the Chinese populace do blame the foreigners for this situation in northern China. They believe that these foreigners have arrived and disturbed the feng shui of the land. The Westerners have built railroads in China, and these railroads uh, cut through the burial grounds of Chinese ancestors. And 
they have also built churches in these Chinese villages and the churches tower above the other buildings. And there's this rumor that perhaps the steeples are bottling up the sky and so rain can't come. So there's this sort of superstitious attitude that is anti-foreign. But in addition to that, there are also Christian missionaries throughout China. Missionaries gained access to China following the treaties that were signed in the wake of the Opium War that really opened up China to the Western powers, including missionaries. And they went throughout China in these villages and their presence really did disrupt the fabric of Chinese society. The missionaries were not beholden to Chinese law. And so they could often get their converts, Chinese Christian converts, they could finagle them out of legal proceedings. And they had more resources as well, such as food. So Chinese who had converted to Christianity were often labeled rice Christians by their resentful neighbors. There was this, oh, you've converted for, not for the faith, but for the resources and the yeah. influence provided by the missionaries. And of course, these resentful Chinese neighbors are starving as well. And they want, you know, um, some kind of organization to belong to. And if you don't join the missionaries and go with the church, another option is a secret society such as the boxers. So we've got the church, we've got the boxers. And it's no surprise then that starting really in 1898 into 1899, the boxers start attacking Chinese Christian converts. So they're the first victims of the boxers and they are killed by tens of thousands and they have to flee their villages. The Westerners aren't super concerned about this at first because it does seem like a conflict that's maybe between Chinese people. Mm -hmm. But then as we go into New Year's Eve, uh, before we enter 1900, a British missionary is beheaded by boxers. And then the Westerners start to worry. And then there are more attacks against Christian missionaries. And then there are attacks really against Westerners, really anybody, railroad workers as well. So the Westerners in China are starting to worry. And some of those um, foreigners in China live in the legation quarter in Beijing. So that's the quarter that's home to all of the diplomats, uh, diplomats of 11 different nations, including the United States. And one of those diplomats is the US minister, Edwin Conger. And he is very nervous, so he, you know, sends a message to the Navy and the Navy ends up sending a ship in March to have a naval presence there. Uh, and Conger also puts his head together with the other ministers and they decide we'd really like to have a guard here protecting us so we don't get beheaded by boxers. So in late May, early June, you've got 407 sailors and Marines from these foreign nations that arrive at the legation quarter. And among them, as you would noted, are 56 sailors and Marines. 50 of them are our Marines. So it is a mostly Marine guard, which I, I should note because I'm here at Marine Corps University, um, and six are sailors. And so they are part of that guard and they are in for a siege. At first, you know, boxers are mainly just annoying the perimeter, but in late June, the average dowager Sishi of China uh, declares war on the foreign powers. And that is in response to foreign navies seizing some forts and it, she declares war. And then we've got the Qing Empire's imperial soldiers joining the boxers and a 55 day siege begins. So these 407 sailors and Marines are in for quite a time and they have to cooperate and use resources that are available in order to survive. And so two instances that I will highlight, what we're looking at here is the Tartar Wall. And this borders the legation quarter in Beijing. So it's on the south side. Uh, part of it is next to the German legation and the other part, the western part, borders the US legation. And because of that, the Americans are responsible for holding part of this wall. And it's critical because if the Chinese were able to take this wall, they could you know, have a direct line of fire yeah. into the legations quarter life would be pretty untenable at that point. So they had to hold the wall. Um, and so Marines really, for a lot of the siege, were up here day and night getting very little sleep. And they had to build barricades. And so they actually used the stones that were already on top the wall and were able to remove these massive stones to stack these barricades. And then to protect their heads, they didn't have sandbags to stack on top. So they used the earth bag is what they refer to. And it's really just this fabric stuffed with dirt and the women in the legation quarter would make them. So 
satin and sackcloth were side by side, these earth bags stacked at stacked atop and they had these improvised barricades to defend themselves. And actually on the right you see, so I'll first start, on the left you see the inner wall. So there's a ramp going up to the top and you can sort of see some of these stones that are stacked on the ramp. And you can yeah. also see to the left, it actually looks like some stones have been removed. So they're kind of moving around the material. And then on the on the outer picture we have that outside part of the wall that was held. And you can see these bastions jutting out every 100 yards. And on top of this bastion is where these barricades would have been built. And there was actually one point in the summer in which the US had a barricade on one side of the bastion and the Chinese had gotten so close that they were sharing the same bastion and were barricaded on the other side. So you can, this visual kind of shows you just how close they got to each other. So we've got the earth bags and the improvised barricades, and now we can flip to the next slide, and I'll talk about one of my favorite um, stories of innovation and adaptation from the monograph, which is the international gun. So U.S. Uh, Navy gunner's mate, first class Joseph Mitchell, uh, is one of the six sailors at the legation quarter, and he arrives and he is manning the artillery, but the allies are running low on artillery. They don't have a lot left, and what the guns they do have left are simply too inefficient. So they try to figure out what else can we use to defend ourselves. We're surrounded by the Chinese with all of, all of these modern weapons. And so Joseph Mitchell starts trying to build a cannon with a pump. Uh, but before he can finish with that effort, some Chinese Christian refugees in the legation quarter find a bronze barrel of a cannon. And I believe I read in one account that they found it in a junk shop. They don't know exactly the origins, but it's possible it was from the Second Opium War and mm -hmm. from the Anglo-French expedition that reached into China. And so this is really a godsend because he now has a cannon barrel. He doesn't have anything else, but he has something to work yeah, it's with. A start, right? It's a start, mm -hmm. exactly. Uh, so. So what does he do? And I think this really kind of represents the collaboration that took place in the legation quarter because he starts using parts from every nation. So the Italians had a one pounder that they brought, but it had run out of its ammunition. So they take the gun carriage from that. And as you can see in this image, uh, which is from Marine Corps University, by the way, as were the wall images, um, there's rope that's tying the barrel to the gun carriage. Oh, yeah. So it's just rope. <laughs> Uh, so not the most high tech, but gets the job done. So he ties it with rope and then he needs to have shells he can fire. And so these shells are Russian shells. The Russians, I think this is so funny, they had left Tianjin, a city in the interior of China, and come to Beijing. And they brought their shells, but they had somehow forgotten their field piece in Tianjin. So they arrive with just these shells and they don't want them to fall, fall into Chinese hands. So they throw them down a well. And then now they have a use for them. So they haul the shells up from the well and they aren't a perfect fit in the barrel, but they are able to sort of pound them in and fire and yeah. kind of hollow it out. So it's a very elegant process. Uh, and, and that's how the international gun is born. She also, I think they also nicknamed the gun uh, Betsy or the Empress Dowager. So they had, they had some other nicknames as well. So this gun, as I said, is sort of symbolic of the collaboration because it's not a well-oiled machine, which I think I wrote in my monograph, and it emitted a cloud of smoke every time it fired, which let the Chinese know where to aim their rifles. Uh, but it did get the job done. Um, and a sort of interesting anecdote is the gun, I think, also can sort of symbolize some inter-service rivalry that occurred at the tail end and after the Boxer Rebellion because after the conflict was over and the legations had been relieved, the gun just sort of lays around, the nations claim their parts, and that bear cannon is still there. And the Marines want to take it with them, but they're told that it will be part of a monument if they leave it in Beijing. So they decide to leave it, and that promise does not come to fruition. The gun, the, that bronze barrel just continues to lie there, and ultimately, a U.S. Army captain finds it. And he goes, oh, did anyone else claim this? Okay, well, I think I'll, I'll take it then. And so he ships it to Nagasaki and then on to West Point. And the, is that where it is today? No, don't worry. It's not the end of the story. Oh, okay. 
So <laughs> the Navy and Marine Corps were not happy about this. Uh, Bowman McCullough, who was a Navy officer there, writes a very angry letter to the Secretary of the Navy. And then Captain Myers, the Marine officer during the siege, provides his own testimony to sort of establish this Navy connection to the gun. So within a year, 1901, um, there are some exchanges between the Secretary of the Navy and the Secretary of War, and the gun does make its way. It is shipped from West Point to Annapolis, and that is where it is today. It's at the U.S. Naval Academy Museum. It is in storage for now. One day I really hope to see it, um, but not on display at the moment, I don't believe, but they did send me some images of it, which was very cool to see, and that's where it is. And I do think it is kind of a symbol of the rivalry because after the legations are relieved, there is this question of who gets to guard the legation yeah. quarter, the Army or the Marine Corps, that persists for a bit until ultimately the Marine Corps is allowed to allowed to stay. Yeah, so, I recall in even in like the victory parade, if you want to call it that, yes. at the very end there was that rivalry started coming out, like who gets to be in the parade. Who, who gets, gets to, to be in front, parade. who gets to yeah. be represented, definitely. This is an image of sailors repairing a railroad in China. And so this image is from the Seymour expedition. So this is the first expedition to try to relieve the legation quarter and the besieged sailors and Marines there. So this was a force of about 2,066 men. Well, I say about, that is a pretty precise number. That's the number given in the Secretary of the Navy's report. And in that, around 2,000 are 112 Americans mostly sailors, but some Marines are recorded as well under Navy Captain Bowman McCalla. And here they're repairing the railroad because they piled into train cars and were hoping to have a nice, you know, several hour train ride from mm -hmm. Tianjin to Beijing. I think in more peaceful times, it could have been a three hour trip. Uh, that didn't happen here. The boxers had done an excellent job dismantling the tracks. Uh, and so the Navy sailors really kind of have to adapt and figure out how to repair a railroad in a really, a really expedient amount of time. But unfortunately, progress does bog down and this expedition fails. It does not reach the legation quarter. And that is in part because its officers were inexperienced with working together with coalition warfare, how to organize themselves. So that did bog them down. And in addition, they had underestimated the Chinese. I think First of all, they did not foresee the Empress Dowager throwing her forces behind the boxers. And second, they simply had underestimated the Chinese army. So Captain Makala, who's there, talks about in his, his unpublished memoir that he was surprised the first time he saw the Chinese army. And he was surprised to see that they were well uniformed and that they had Western, they had rifles. He had no idea that Western, including American companies, had been sending weapons to China, which seems like a pretty, seems like something he should know, but he did not. And so they were certainly in for a time. And truthfully, the Seymour expedition is quite lucky that they weren't all killed. Yeah. They really are. They, that definitely could have happened, but there was some luck on their side for sure. Uh, they stumbled upon an arsenal that saved them, and they happened to have a Chinese servant that was able to send a message to Tianjin about their location. And the only reason this Chinese servant wasn't killed when he reached the foreigners in Tianjin is because he knew semaphore signals from working for a bit in the British Navy. So there was a lot of luck involved in this Seymour expedition even, even surviving, um, but most of them did. Uh, and what we're looking at here are junks. So these are Chinese sailing vessels and they are following the curve of the high river. So this is a picture from the second expedition to try to relieve the legation quarter. The first one I showed you on the railroads, that was early June. Mm -hmm. This is in early August. So quite a bit of time has passed for the poor beleaguered uh, sailors and Marines in Beijing. Uh, but this, this sets out on August 4th from Tianjin. And they've kind of, they've learned their lesson a bit. So instead of around 2,000 men, they have a reported strength of around 20,000 men, so about 10 times the force. And they are clearly following the river, which takes you almost all the way to Beijing, and they've given up on the railroad. Mm -hmm. um, still, though, despite the fact that this expedition does ultimately succeed, they are hampered by poor coordination. They're hampered by internal rivalries and by the intense summer heat. And all three of those factors do increase casualties among 
the Allies. Um, despite these obstacles, though, they do reach Beijing. U.S. soldiers scale the walls of Beijing, and there's a very kind of famous uh, painting of a yeah. yeah Calvin P. Titus a bugler, I believe, a musician just climbing the walls. And he was the first one to climb the walls, which I guess is another another example of using the resources they had. They didn't have they didn't have ladders or anything like that. So they climbed them. They threw down some rope to pull up their weapons. Um, and so they do ultimately relieve the legations. And and the next day, uh, August 15th, the U.S. force fights its way really all the way to the doors of the Forbidden City. There are minutes from positioning their cannon and blasting their way through the doors when a message comes from their allies that they should hold off and maybe not do that right. yet. Yeah. So they can all parade through together, um, <laughs> which gets me to my last slide. That is on August 28th, the, the allies parade through the Forbidden City. They really didn't know if they should, what they should do. They didn't know how to handle the Forbidden City, but they did. They ultimately decided they wanted to, I guess, leave their mark and make an entrance. So each country flies the flag of its nation. As you noted, there was there was uh, arguments over who got to go first. I think the Japanese really wanted to go first, but the Russians ultimately got to go first. So they they marched through. And in this in this force, we have uh, two companies of Marines. So one of the companies in this parade is commanded by Smedley Butler, that I'm sure many of our audience know, um, but who would go on to win or earn two medals of honor. And the other commanded by future commandant of the Marine Corps, Wendell C. Neville. So they march through and really that's that. The door is closed. There's n really no other trace they leave, but they did enter the Forbidden City. And so all in all, 1,200 Marines were in China at various stages of the Boxer Rebellion. The Marine Corps, out of all the US services, really had the most consistently strong presence throughout the conflict. The Navy had the strongest presence in the beginning, but by the end, we're doing more of a logistical support role, mm -hmm. sending supplies in. Um, and the Army didn't arrive until July, but the Marines were there the whole time. And that is reflected in the fact that out of 59 Medals of Honor, 33 went to the Marine Corps. And one of those went to Private Dan Daly. That was his first Medal of Honor, which he got likely for a night on, in July when he was single-handedly defending a section of that Tartar Wall, uh, bordering the legation quarter against the Chinese Imperial troops. Um, so as you noted, the Boxer Rebellion definitely makes for an intriguing case study, given that it was the US military's first taste of coalition warfare kind of on a global stage and its first time meeting China on the battlefield. And so as a result, it is rich with lessons learned uh, from for the US Navy and Marine Corps. Uh, a couple that I'll highlight are a need to develop personnel for coalition operations, you know, equipping its officers with the foreign language skills to even communicate with their allies, mm -hmm. which was, as you probably saw, lacking during this conflict. Hand signals were often used. Um, and uh, the ability and training to kind of organize structures of command with their allies as well, maybe a little bit less making it up as you go along, which definitely did occur uh, in, yeah. in the Boxer Rebellion. Um, another lesson. Uh, is that the officers during the Boxer Rebellion, you know, had a clear prejudice towards the Chinese. They had stereotypes in their head, and this caused them to es underestimate who they were up against. So kind of the need to combat this prejudice and preconceived notions with intelligence. So they had an accurate picture of who they were even fighting. And then finally, this ability to make sure that you can adapt your skill sets to an unfamiliar environment, since that really was critical for the survival of the US military personnel at every stage of the conflict. So that is my, my brief presentation. I'm happy to chat further and answer any audience questions as well. It uh, looks like we've already got some questions coming oh, well. in here. OK. So that's great. Um, a couple of things I wanted to just kind of jump off with. Sure. Though. Um, the, and really the first one is, is getting into that sort of battlefield adaptation and innovation, yeah. which was sort of from the very beginning and then all the way through the attempts to relieve the legation as well as inside the legation itself, uh, was one of the things that really jumped out at me, you mm -hmm. know, and, and not for a number of reasons, partly because I'm sitting in a center for innovation, right. In future warfare, um, you know, but the, the, the sheer variety of things that the sailors and Marines and the other. Uh, other um, Western forces had to do um, 
it, it was it was amazing. So like mm -hmm. fixing the railroad, as you said. Yes. Um, but what else was there? Using the junks and you know local aquatic riverine craft yep. to move your logistics. Uh, the international gun, which I I didn't catch the rope thing on there um, <laughs> in the initial read through. So that's that's equally impressive. Uh, and then up to climbing the walls. Is there anything to ascribe to how the various forces were able to constantly do those adaptations? Because I would like I look yeah. at you know say say you took a bunch of random marines and sailors today how many could fix a railroad right like if you said tracks broken Gosh. go i need a working party to go fix it i i don't know that you'd have necessarily that the skill sets like right there so how what allowed like where did all those skill sets come from how were they able to 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 do all these innovations and adaptations again and again and again what what, yeah. was, what was in there that let them do that that's a good question I think a lot of it did come down to individuals being able who did were lucky enough to have certain skill sets um, play up their role and then help their fellow servicemen figure out what they were doing. So, for example, with this railroad repair, I mean, repairing a railroad is a highly skilled, uh, highly skilled task, and so highly skilled. In fact, I think the hardest part that they wrote about in the Boxer Rebellion was the act of driving the spikes. Like mm -hmm. that was something truthfully that not all the sailors and Marines could do. It, it so happened that they were lucky enough that one of the sailors on the expedition had worked on a railroad before and was able to drive the spikes and fill that role. And then some of the, I guess, other kind of tasks of just like lugging the rails and laying them down might have been slightly less mm -hmm. highly skilled and they were just able to to muscle it. And then, so I do think there was some element of luck of having, having people with certain, mm -hmm. certain skills, because for example, the, um, another one I didn't even mention is the, uh, water tenders and machinist mates from USS Monocacy. And they were, um, Navy sailors that adapted their skill sets to repair train cars and get them, mm -hmm. get them going. And I, I guess they were just able to figure out what they'd done on the ship and like certain things just weren't that different. Like steam and engine to steam engine. Right? Exa exactly. I think there was, there was some element of that as well. They, they really were able to translate their skills from ship to, to engines and, and that worked in their favor. So, so I would say really the skills of individuals rather than a whole, a whole force just happening to be able to know what they were doing. Yeah, and I, I bring it up because, you know, it, in our Q&A, we're not going to try and, you know, reach parallels from back then to today. But mm -hmm. it, a thing, you know, going on in the Marine Corps today is talent management, better utilizing those individual skills that, you know, people bring with them into the service. Mm -hmm. You know, so I just, I look at it and it's an interesting story of, you know, how do you repair a railroad, right? Yeah. Well, maybe you just ask, ask your Marines and sailors who's got experience on this problem. Yep. Let them go do it. So it, just, it was just amazing that they just, they constantly had to find their new problems that they had to yeah. just figure out ways to do it with what they had. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the railroad one's an interesting one too, because since they really were limited with how many people could drive the spikes, they did end up hiring Chinese workers mm -hmm. to help them drive the spikes too. So maybe, maybe a story there too, of at some point also realizing your limitations and seeing what else you can do to get the job done. Yeah. Maybe the people who live by the railroad might have some experience. <laughs> in that. Yeah. Yeah. Go ask. With the Chinese forces, the second thing I sort of had was the um, you talk in the book initially um, sort of the boxers were the first force to go up against the um, both the legation and then the release force. And as you mentioned, initially, their their approach to warfare didn't exactly serve them well. You know, no. they, they thought they were invulnerable to bullets and then they found out that they weren't. Mm -hmm. um, and they also tended to, I think, have a lot of sort of, you know, melee type weapons hand to hand. Not so much. But then you had. The, the Chinese, the Imperial Chinese forces who, you know, they were uniforms, they were armed, basically this, well, they, they had weapons from the West because they were given to them. It was odd that um, they sort of got the first expedition, but the second one got through and eventually the, the Western countries were able to relieve the legation. So what, why do you think that the, the conventional Chinese, the Imperial forces were not able to um, stop that second one or take the legation? Because I, I realized like, taking a, a four or five position that's incredibly hard, but they had they had similar weaponry, they had vastly greater numbers. How or why were they not able to ultimately um, get through the siege or stop that second mm -hmm. expedition? That's a great question because really they should have been able to. There's, if you look at uh, after the siege, how many 
uh, guns were found lying around Beijing in their corrupt cases, like just, just around and not utilized, there's definitely a question of why didn't this happen? And, you know, Captain Myers of the Marine Corps did also wonder this. And part of, he had two reasons he speculated in his proceedings article on why this might have been the case. One, he was said perhaps the Chinese officers didn't lead them. And two, he speculated perhaps the Chinese were afraid that the foreigners had spirit soldiers on their side. So it really wasn't the second. He, that was definitely reflecting his attitude towards mm -hmm. the Chinese. But I think he was onto something with the first explanation. But it's not because the Chinese officers were incompetent at leading their forces. It's because they were divided and they did not know how to handle these foreigners in China. So there, there was a split among these Chinese generals about what to do. On the one hand, you had generals such as Dong Fujiang, uh, who was fiercely anti-foreign and wanted to really drive home the attack, kill the foreigners, be done with it. Mm -hmm. And then you had the commander in chief of the main Qing imperial force, Rong Lu, who was leader of the guards army. Um, and he, he was torn. He didn't, he didn't like the foreigners in China, and he has this close relationship with the empress, so he shared many of her views there. But he had this, under, this more forward-looking understanding that if we destroy the legation quarter, they're not, they're not just going to go away. Not this, is, be happy this is not going to be good for us. And so I think he sort of understood that China was being opened up, whether, whether they liked it or not. And so... And that destroying legations might incur the wrath of many of the most powerful nations in the world. Mm -hmm. And so why I think they weren't ultimately able to destroy the legations or stop that second force is there were generals such as Rung Lu that were likely, historians have speculated he was likely withholding his artillery and not driving home the attack as, attacks as much as, as much as he could. And when that second relief force is fighting its way through to Beijing, they're really just up against, I believe, Dong Fujiang's force. They're up against a much smaller imperial army because so many of the other generals have not thrown the weight of their, their divisions behind him. And also at that point, there's less boxer resistance too. And there's a couple reasons this could have been. It could have been that it finally started raining. Uh, and so they were able to go home and maybe there were crops they could yeah. finally tend to. And it could also be because at that point they had significantly decimated the Chinese Christian population who, and they were kind of enemy number, number one. So I think those were, those were kind of the factors of a lack of leadership, but an intentional lack of leadership on the Chinese officer's side. Uh, kind of just through what I had, we got we do have some questions in the chat. Uh, for sir, anything you want to throw out there first? I mean, I, I, I think the um, the importance of you know, cross cultural you know training was that even in a, a thought or forethought or or did that evolve as as things manifested out there? Sure, it definitely was not a forethought. They were, I think, from the accounts you can see clearly that they had very little understanding of really anything culturally about their, their al the Chinese and their allies. Um, there were during, it was definitely a thought during the actual conflict, and you did see instances where they were trying to actually, especially in the legation quarter, I think collaboration in the legation quarter may have been the most cohesive because they were, they had to, they had to work and work yeah. together, whereas some, some of the relief expedition there was a little more time for squabbling amongst themselves because they weren't the threat of death was not quite as imminent um and in the legation quarter there certainly was this effort to like share culture and maybe bond that way like the russians made tea in their samovar and uh u.s officers would go over to the R russian legation and indulge in that and have tea with them and so there was this this sharing of culture to kind of strengthen strengthen ties and the russians in the u.s they needed to work together. Their legations were right across from each other. So they were responsible for responsible for building and manning a shared barricade. Great. And actually, that, that jumps into um, one of the first questions here in the chat uh, from Albert Lee. And this gets into, so the coalition you sort of had to learn about each other because you were all, you weren't going to survive if you didn't, you know, but you mentioned that the, the underestimation of Chinese capabilities um, at the beginning of the conflict, right? And... Uh, 
so the question from Albert is, was that, was there any attempt to fix that after the fact, right? Like to do that sort of what we would call operational culture or like a study of your adversary mm. to, to no kidding, be like, okay, we obviously we undersold them, right? You know, maybe we should study them more closely in case we have to go back and do this again down the road. I'm curious about the answer because we, uh, I was on a listening to um, Wargaming panel earlier this week at Sea Air Space and they were talking about how the very famous, you know, before World War II, US Navy War College did all the war games. And so they were never surprised about anything, you know, Nimitz loved the war games. But the panelists also mentioned, you know, that sounds good on paper, but the US Navy also severely underestimated. They thought Japanese couldn't see at night, right? So they couldn't fight at night. And it turned out, um, you know, Battle of Savo Island and a lot of the fighting around Guadalcanal at the very beginning. Yeah, they're actually really, really good at night fighting. They train specifically to do that. And that caused the US Navy uh, a lot of problems early on because of that underestimation. So did you see after, you know, after yeah. this was over, was there any attempt to to address that or, um, you know, if there was, did it not sort of stick through the, you know, through future conflicts? You know, you're, you're inspiring me to want to go see if I can dig up some uh, intelligence reports from the time. I haven't, I did not come across those in my research, but what I can say is that the Navy Intelligence Office was relatively new at that time. Mm -hmm. It had just been around for a little bit when the conflict started. So my guess is that they were just that part of the lack of intelligence may have stemmed from that. But also, I do believe that there would have been more of a focus because the US military then main, maintained a more solid presence in China. So while I haven't seen the reports, what I can say is after this conflict, there was a push to learn a lot more and to kind of chart out the geography and uh, understand the country at a much higher level. So the US Navy, after the Boxer Rebellion, actually became, before the Boxer Rebellion, it had started kind of exploring China. Um, it had sent some ships up the Yangtze River a little bit, but afterwards there was this much more increased, this increased push to build ships specifically to go up the Yangtze River yeah. and chart the river and learn more about both the geography and the country. So I can say from the US Navy's actions specifically post-conflict, there was a concerted effort to learn more about China. Although I guess maybe maybe they studied China more, but it's possible it didn't translate to other adversary yeah. studies. Um, yeah. All I, I know China specific, but. Yeah. Um, OK, um, next question. This is actually from uh, Nayla Mengel, and she's a regular Brewcast audience member. Okay. She's also a docent at the Marine Corps Museum. Very so cool. She often gives us some very interesting little tidbits about stuff that's over there. But uh, her question to you is because she's a docent and regularly talks about Dan Daly is one of those mm -hmm. sort of, you know, part of the Marine Corps pantheon. Um, was there anything in your studies, any anything more that you learned about the circumstances around his the meritorious action? Um, sure. 13, 14 August, which I'm assuming is when he got it or what he was cited for his Medal of Honor that okay. you can share. This is a, a super interesting question because the date that Dan Daly's Medal of Honor is awarded doesn't actually line up with his most heroic actions that he was that he was likely recommended for the Medal of Honor for. So this was something that I was scratching my head about as I was researching because Dan Daly's really big moment that he is known for is single-handedly defending the Tartar Wall. And what had happened was the U.S. Marines had a barricade, but the U.S. minister in the legation told them that he actually wanted them to build a barricade further 100 yards east, I believe. And that's because the Germans had actually abandoned their side of the wall at a oh. certain point. Yes, uh, some Chinese imperial troops had succeeded in driving the Germans from the wall. They were up against some troops on their side. The U.S. was up against troops on the other side. And when the Germans left, the U.S. needed to expand their position. Mm -hmm. So they'd gotten orders to build a barricade 100 yards further east that would protect the water gate. And the water gate was critical pr to protect because they knew that when the International Relief Force finally arrived, that's how they would go in. They would go in through this gate. And so Dan Daly and Captain Marine Captain Newt Hall went along um, to the point where they were supposed to build this barricade and they were waiting for Chinese workers uh, within the legation quarter to come up with earth bags and the material they needed to start building. And they weren't coming. And so the story is, and this happened in mid-July, the story is then that 
Captain Newt Hall didn't know what to do. He didn't want to leave Dan Daly there alone, but the workers weren't coming and they needed to build this gate. They couldn't they couldn't wait for the Chinese Imperial troops to figure out they were there. So Dan Daly says, that's okay, go back for the for the workers. I'll stay here and defend the wall on my own. And so Newt Hall goes back, figures out that the workers were with a translator that didn't speak English, so they didn't know where to go, but he's able to lead them back and they start this barricade. And then Captain Hall commends Dan Daly for his actions for single-handedly guarding the wall at this point. But that was in July. And so then when I read this citation and I saw the August date, I was I was scratching my head. I can't I have not been able to locate what he might have done in August that would have accounted for the Medal of Honor mm -hmm. that's more heroic than his wall action. But what I can say is that I'm not the first one to be a little befuddled by this. Um, there's a journalist, Charlie Roberts, who's written a book on Dan Daly. And he notes in his book kind of the same dilemma. And his conclusion is that that date may have just gotten stuck on there because that's when the legations were relieved. Mm -hmm. But he speculates that Dan, Dan Daly got the medal for his actions in July. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's interesting because... Um... For Smedley Butler and his first medal, um, we had author Jonathan Katz on last year, I think. Oh, cool. Yeah, you know, his book, The Life of Smedley Butler, basically Gangsters of Capitalism. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, Smedley was kind of there through um, a lot of that sort of early to mid 20th century U.S. Marine yep. Corps history, expeditionary um, operations. And this was, I think, the first one. No, I'm sorry. I think he went to the he went to Cuba first and then he went to he was involved in this. Um but he he mentioned in, in some of the other writings that uh, Smelly didn't think he deserved like he deserved the medal that he got, and that there... oh, was this at Veracruz? Maybe okay, maybe I'm maybe I'm conflating. I've actually I just wrote the article about okay. Veracruz that's on our website. So so Smedley Butler didn't actually earn a Medal of Honor for his actions during the Boxer Rebellion. Okay, I must be in my day. That's totally fine. I think this is super interesting that the Marine and Navy officers weren't eligible for the medal until 1915. Um, and since this is 1900, there were a bunch, I mean, it's possible the Marine Corps Medals of Honor could have been even higher. Um, and instead they were, I think Smedley Butler was breveted a captain mm -hmm. and that was his reward for okay, his yeah, actions. Yeah, his first, I think you're thinking of Veracruz where he yeah, didn't opinion. think he deserved it and he wrote, he wrote an angry letter to his mother about how his award was, how being bestowed that honor for Veracruz was cheapening our nation's greatest honor. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm probably conflating it. Um, I just know I, I've read, like, I've seen some other Medal of Honor citations from, yes. like, the very, I don't know, the first 50 to 60 years the medal was offered. And a lot of them, like, I've seen some where it's, like, two sentences. Awarded yes. for valor on this date. And you're, like, nothing about And that's a lot what of what happened. these are like. That's exactly what dan daly's is like it does no specifics i think the one one specific one i found was there was a hospital apprentice in the legation quarter who was specifically awarded for carrying a message down a street in heavy fire so you're like okay i know what he did but gunner's mate joseph mitchell who built the international gun he also got a medal of honor his citation is that is that exactly what you were saying like two lines he was brave no specifics yeah yeah it's just it, it's it's odd. It's interesting to me because, uh, you know, we periodically write awards, you know, as, yes. as officers. And you're like, for the starting at like the lowest one, you got to have like a small essay, like you need a lot of detail. And it's just interesting to compare to these older ones where it's like, awarded for valor on the state. Yeah. would love to know the story behind it, but there's no. I would too. Really you bad. really have to dig. And I think mm -hmm. that totally makes sense because I think these, these early conflicts to the Medal of Honor count is so high uh, often. Mm -hmm. And so clearly over time, they've been. Uh, establishing other awards and raising the bar for what it takes to get a Medal of Honor, because the, I'm I'm sure there probably were some some Marines and sailors and soldiers that were awarded Medals of Honor here that by today's standards would not would not have qualified. Yeah. Yeah, and, but conversely, you know, you look at the the details of some of the actions around, you know, around this or um, fast forward to World War One or rewind back to other conflicts. Like you know, people were still doing these incredibly sometimes suicidal actions of bravery mm -hmm. on the battlefield so like th that they were being brave is you know is a gift and it's just it's really you kind of wish you could just get more in some of these stories you do and you know one thing i will say about smedley butler though is 
why I think anyone reading this would assume he got a Medal of Honor is because he, he like Dan Daly in this conflict, did have a lot of those kind of actions where there was a battle in Tianjin where he you know, rescued a wounded man in the trench and mm -hmm. was fought, was um, shot in, in doing so. And then he was scaling the wall in Beijing and he was nearly killed, but the button glance, or sorry, the bullet glanced yeah. off a button on his uniform. So you would think, you would think he would have walked away with one. Yeah. He got another one eventually anyway. Yeah, so. he got enough. Um, so we're coming up on an hour here. And, All right. Um, conscious of 95 traffic. I want you to have to fight it too oh. much on the way back. But um, before we end, so you've, um, you know, you've got your first monograph out here. What yes. are you working on now that we can make you look forward to? Oh, gosh. So, well, what I can say is I did, I mentioned it before, but I did just put out an article on Veracruz, the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps in Veracruz. Um, that's on our website, history.navy.mil. Okay, we'll put it in the show my little, my little plug. Um, and I do think that's a really exciting one uh, because like the Boxer Rebellion, you see sailors and Marines working together and you see sailors and Marines leaving these ships to do a landing. I think one of, one of the things that's most fascinating to me about both the Boxer Rebellion and Veracruz is the amount of fighting that took place on land. So mm -hmm. a very different kind of Navy story for Naval History and Heritage Command to put out. So you can certainly check that out. Uh, and then you can also look forward to seeing the books I'm currently editing. I currently have a book I'm editing on U.S. Navy innovation. So it's in its earlier stages, but should be out in, you know, before before the uh, fiscal year is done. Uh, so those yeah. are my those are my current projects. Yeah. Well, no, I'm something to look forward to. Again, we are a center for innovation, so yeah, looking to learn about yeah, and U.S. Navy different, innovation, different mm -hmm. approaches from whether it's historical or today. Yeah, that's uh, good information to have. And then I, I highlighted this in red and then I forgot about it. But I'm going to ask it before I forget. Sure. So for this specific book, how yes. can members in the audience get a copy? Yes. So at Naval History and Heritage Command, because we are a government agency, we are not selling our books. So there are a select number of print copies that have gone to various libraries. So if you are a member of the audience that does have access to certain libraries or some university libraries there's also the naval academy mm -hmm. uh there's the library here Probably has there, received yeah. multiple copies so if you have that coveted cat carter access there's certainly copies floating around but everyone can get a copy on our website history.navy.mil publications and then publications by subject and that is where we have all of our publications grouped by whatever topic you are most interested in and that Digital edition is free to download, um, free to read. And so that is probably the easiest way to access it. Yeah, great. And we'll, again, we'll put a link to that in the show notes as well so people can go and download it directly. Okay, well, um, Emily, thank you very much for your time. Thank for you. Coming down here today. It was great to hear more about this story. And uh, like, again, we'll put all those resources in the show notes so people can go and dig deeper into what the Naval History um, Heritage Command is putting out. You know, it's mm -hmm. a, as a partner in history to the Marine Corps history yes. division here. And uh, to our audience, thanks again for joining us uh, for another episode of the Brewcast. We hope you come back next week because we've got two great back-to-back -back episodes in the works next Tuesday, April 11th. Um, we're actually, I didn't put this together until just now, but we're going to be taking a look at some other history, uh, another historical retrospective. But we're welcoming back Brewcast alum Skip Crawley for a look at Operation Downfall. And uh, for those not familiar, that was the the name for the planned invasion of Japan at the end of World War II, uh, following the Battle of Okinawa, and uh, had that it was not executed, obviously because the war um, were ended following the dropping of the two atomic bombs. But if it had gone forward, uh, it would have been the largest amphibious operation in history, as well as probably history's bloodiest single campaign, as the the casualty estimates for both sides were were in the millions. Um, but it did get to the point where there was a lot of detail on that plan. So Skip is going to talk us through. What, it, uh, what the plan was, what it would have looked like, and what people were expecting. And then on Wednesday, April 12th, we will be joined by Team Krulak's own fearless leader, Brigadier General Valerie Jackson. She's currently serving as the Deputy Commanding General for Combined Joint, Combined Joint Task Force Horn of Africa, and she'll join us uh, from Horn of Africa to talk about the valuable work that the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines of the Combined Joint Task Force are doing in the region to support African partners and allies and strengthen the strategic influence of the United States against global competitors. So we'll be we have been advertising on those. Uh, please register and join us, and we'll see you all then. Thank you.
Thanks for joining us. As always, we depend on support and feedback from the Team Crewland community to constantly improve our offerings and reach a wider audience. So if you have feedback on this episode, please take a moment to fill out the survey linked in the show notes to help us do better. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel on YouTube or leave us a review on the podcast app of your choice. It truly does help us reach a wider audience. Thank you as always for your support and we'll see you on the next episode. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.